Uh, my name is Guillermo Gancio. I work at the Argentine Institute of Red Astronomy. Two things first. First, I want to thank to the LOC from the Casper Workshop for giving me the opportunity to be here and for the support that they're giving me. And second, if uh, there is anything that you don't understand thanks to my beautiful English pronunciation, please uh, let me know. I will start with a little description of where I come from, where is the institute. It was created in the 60s with the purpose of research and develop radio astronomy in Argentina. It was dedicated to observe the 21 centimeter line, hydrogen line. Uh, we have uh, two antennas, one in the 66, and the second one was built in the 70s. Uh, one was mainly used for um, profile line emission and spectroscopy, and the other one was used more for continuum line and polarization observations. There was, they were built in the north to south direction, so they are not for interferometry for some reason. And the last scientific research done with both antennas was around the year 2000 until the year 2015. So we are trying to recover almost 15 years, actually a little more because the electronics is old. So we're trying to catch up in, in the technology. We are located in Argentina in the East Coast, between the city of Buenos Aires and La Plata. That little green spot is a provincial park. It's a very nice place to, to work, just to know where I come from. So a little bit of to finish the, the history. So uh, in the year 98, 2000 was the last scientific use of, of, of both antennas. They are used to map the galaxy with in in the 21 centimeter. Between the year 2000 and the, and the year 2015, when we started using again, only one receiver was operational. Uh, actually, it was half of the receiver because it has only one polarization working. So we started doing some research, some experiments, actually, nothing scientific, with some cheap software defender radio, these USB dongles, like the one you saw yesterday in the, in the rooftop. We managed to get some spectral lines, and we managed to do, as an experiment, to observe a pulsar, which is the Bela pulsar is the most intense pulsar in the southern hemisphere. That kept the attention of the scientific community there. And we start to work on a real pulsar uh, research program. We jump to the year 2017. We get one commercial board, one software defined radio board from the ETUS company, the B210, which has 56 megahertz of bandwidth. Wow. So for us, it was like that. And we start a collaboration with the professor, Dr. Carlos Luto, from the Center for Computational Relativity and Gravitation at the Rochester Institute here in the US. So that was the first pulsar observation that we did. Actually, it's the first uh, pulsar observation in Argentina. So that's something so important. And this is a more recent uh, pulsar observation about the pulsar J0437, which is a millisecond pulsar. So what do we have now? on the institute. We have two antennas, 30 meter of diameter. We can trot a source for about uh, three hours and 30 minutes, maybe a little more. If we use them remotely, I can do an observation from here. So if anyone wants to see that, that's nice. So the, we are using all desktop, uh, desktop computers. The software for the acquisition is done in C. Uh, it's in GitHub if you want to take a look at it, but please don't, I read it. I'm not a programmer, so don't do it. And Python for the antenna control. The difference are on the receivers. So the antenna one, which is the one in the, in the end, on the, in the back, um, it, it was the one who was working. It has only one polarization, center and 1.4 uh, gigahertz, 100 megahertz bandwidth, system temperature of 100K. It's a room temperature. It has cryogenics, but we are not using it anymore. It's expensive for us to, to put it back to work, for now at least. And it's an analog receiver. It has a mixer. It's an aterodyne receiver. So we have an EF of 150 megahertz. And we have uh, two of these boards um, working on that polarization. So we have 56 plus 56 megahertz. So we have 100 megahertz of bandwidth. The second antenna we put back in operation in 2018. We have uh, it's a complete new receiver has two polarizations, two megahertz of bandwidth. The system temperature is a little higher than the other one. So if anyone knows about this thing, I would like to talk a little bit to see if you can guide me up a little bit on, on why it should be different. They are kind of the same receivers, so they should be the same. The digitalization is done in RF. So we have the two, the same boards, the same two 
so for the final uh, boards, but at the front end. So we do the digitalization there, and we, as we have two polarizations, we're adding the polarizations in software, so we have 56 plus 56 megahertz. And we have the computer there also on the front end, and we have a fiber optic link, an Ethernet link uh, connected to the control room. So this is a simple block diagram. I put this because I want to make uh, clear that the both receivers are different. One has the mixer stage and goes down to the control room. At the other, we have the digitalization boards on the front end with the computer and we have uh, the, the data taken out. So this may not be necessary, but maybe there are some people that who doesn't know how we observe pulsars. So basically the pulsar is this kind of star. It has uh, two sets of energy coming through the magnetic poles, is rotating very fast, it's like a lighthouse. When, so when one of these sheds keeps in line of the sight with the Earth, we receive a pulse of it, and it repeats uh, all the time. So if you want to observe this, you have to take into account that between the pulsar and the Argentina, and Argentina no, and the Earth, uh, we have the, inter the interstellar medium, and that makes some weird effects on the pulse, for example, this is frequency versus time, and then you see that there is a, a curve shape in the pulse. So if you want to study these things, you want to have two things. First of all, you, have to, you want to have a lot of frequency channels, so you can see every tiny part of the spectrum of it, and you want to do it fast, because these pulsars, they go down to the millisecond regime, and the width of the pulsar could be around the microseconds. So you want, you want to have a lot of frequency channels and with a fast readout, right? So you can later, you can do it online or offline. We do it offline. You can later add um, time delays on the frequency channels. So you can compensate that and do the, the pulsar and get the information of, of the pulsar. So this is the backend that we have. We have two boards connected to a computer. This is quite simple. Uh, we can use them by extend the bandwidth with to up to two, up to 100 megahertz or adding the polarizations. The synchronization is done with a PPS from a GPS. Usually we have a 32 spectrum channels every 40 microseconds. We can go up to 128 channels and 20 microseconds. We have a geodetic observatory, a VLBI observatory nearby, around 500 meters from us. We have connected through a fiber optic, a signal from them from 10 megahertz from their hydrogen maser, and we're going to replace that to the GPS and we want to play a little bit with that. And we have an incredible transfer data rate between the two worlds of around 224 megabytes. Remember, um, the speed or is a relative concept, right? So for us, that was like, wow. And this is actually the, the actual development for, for this thing was in the software. So I work for a long time on the software. Those are kind of the, the milestone that I was getting through the software. You can see I started with five megahertz, one channel on RAM disk. So that was like the first thing that I did. And now we end up with this uh, 112 megahertz. So it's quite, it's quite an achievement for, for us. This is a diagram of the software. The first blocks are just for configuration, the hardware, software, etc. The real part is done in here. So we want to observe pulsars. We want to do timing with the pulsars. So we need to receive the samples, and we cannot lose time or we cannot lose uh, any sample, right? So what we do is we have a few threads carefully synchronized. Sounds good. And uh, so we receive a number of 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 samples, which is what I call a, a packet of, of data. And then I move the, that packet of data to one of the other threads, and I in, immediately I keep receiving the next few samples, right? So I don't lose time between, uh, between one packet and the other, or I shouldn't lose. And while I'm receiving the next packet of data, the next n samples, I do the FFT, the channelization, the average, and also I have a thread to do the right this. Actually, this diagram is wrong because I'm not writing to this every time, but I do, um, 
I fill a buffer and from time to time I write the disk because I don't want to overflow the, the disk uh, writing. So, uh, and we are working in the filter bank format from Sigprog. And this is a little bit advertisement. We want to move from filter bank to pulsar fits. So if anyone knows about that, please let me know so I can ask you a few questions about it. So, other thing that we've been doing in Argentina, we have uh, two deep space antennas, one from the ESA and one is from the China Space Agency. We have the 10% of the time dedicated for radio astronomy, but we are not using it because they don't have any radio astronomical backend. So what we did, we take one of our digital backends, we went to this station down there, we put it in there, and we were able to do observations. We observed several pulsars. This is Vela in the X band, and we do some mosaic images, some calibration source. Um, so, but that was just a test to keep the attention of the researchers. They are interested, and now we want to put um, a fixed backend, a fixed instrument there to do observations. And we want to use the Roach 2 or the Snap. So, one thing I want to say is I learned a lot of things here. I'm learning a lot, and the most important thing that I learned that everything that I'm proposing as the future of radio astronomy in Argentina is completely obsolete. So, <laughs> thank you guys. So this is a little bit of our um, revolution. We start with this little thing, cost $10. We move to this, B210 is around $1,000. Now we have four of these. These are around uh, $800, $900. And we want to move to Casper, so we can use real, real backhands. Uh, these things, they have an FPGA. You can program that FPGA for whatever you want. Um, I know a little bit about BHDL and FPGA, but it wasn't very straightforward for me. So we are using just that as, as a fancy ADC converter. So we're doing everything on, on, the, on the software. But I guess that you can do. You might even be able to port the Casper to dashboard, but I don't think it's, uh, it will be a lot of work and I don't see any gain of it, especially now with the red dial. So this is one of the science uh, results that we've been having. This is the, uh, pul the, um, sorry, the Pulsar Vela. It has a glitch every three years. It glitched this year in January. So we have a few observations before the glitch, which is here because we were on holidays then. We see the report of the glitch, we scream, and then we'll start observing like crazy. So that's the jump between that point and here and the continuous observations. This is like, this is our main science case. This is our science that we are working on. On the timing of this pulsar, this is uh, J0437. That's the improvement in the profile between 2018 and 2019. You can see it's better, right? It's much better. And one of the science that we're taking out from that pulsar is are the timing residuals, which basically, and uh, maybe I'm going to say something wrong, but in a very basic way, you have your, uh, your model of the pulsar, your theoretical model of the pulsar. You have the real measurement and the pulsar. You make the difference between them, and you see what's the timing difference. You see your, the residuals that you get there. With one of the radio telescopes, we have the residual, which is around 0.5 microseconds, which is very nice. And the other one is around 0.8 microseconds, which should be below one microsecond, so we are more than okay. And that was, actually, this one is, was quite a surprise. We were always expecting this one, but that was kind of a surprise. So it was nice to see the system working. So this is for, for Franco. We have RFI problems. And we have the perfect place for test new RFI mitigation techniques. <laughs> so these are this kind of the same observation or around the same time. This is during business hours. Red is bad, so we have a lot of RFI. During the night, seems to be quite decent. Um, this is the antenna one, which is the closest to all the buildings. We have the second antenna, and luckily the second antenna doesn't have RFI, or it has a very narrow band like this one, which is a perfect case for you. Um, but during business hours, we, uh, we almost have no RFI. So 
I think that this RFI is uh, very localized to, to the first uh, antenna. We start also an RFI campaign to teach people about RFI. The observatory wasn't working as an observatory for the last 15 years. We have a lot, of, I, I have to take that out because I didn't have enough time, but we have a lot of researchers doing a lot of scientific things and a lot of things using data from other observatories, theoretical work. Um, but the people wasn't used to, to work in an observatory. So when we start telling them, please stop using the cell phone under the antenna, we are trying to, you laugh, but it is true. Because it's an open place and people was walking around the antenna with the cell phone and say, please don't do that because I'm going to hit you. <laughs> so, okay, where are the next steps after the next steps? So, um, we are working on upgrade the receiver. We want to increase their bandwidth from 100 megahertz to 1 gigahertz. We want to put uh, RF, over fiber, RF over fiber modules that we are developing. Uh, I have almost done that. So we can have the RF at the control room. We are developing some analog backends uh, to, to do the RF to baseband conversion. So we can use the approach to, or I don't know, uh, and a lot of <coughs> upgrades. So our goal is to increase the digital bandwidth from 100 megahertz to 500 megahertz at least for both radio telescopes for both radio telescopes at both polarizations so we can have 2 gigahertz of bandwidth total so these are more nice numbers for you with a real pulsar backend casper so at the moment i have uh, or we have two students working on casper on the casper toolflow learning doing the tutorials uh, reading about the fpgas about well, they are this whole year working on that it's a theoretic work because we don't have the board yet. We're working on it in, in some ways. But the idea is if we get, when we get one of these boards, we already have the students to know how to use them. And the next year, you are going to have two PhD students, one from engineer, another from astronomy, for do digital development with the boards that I hope to get between this year and the next year. And that will lead us to our contribution to the world domination. So, I want to mention the Chile University because they've been working a lot with the, with the Roach and the Casper boards. And maybe we're the next ones there. So there is a big void down there and I want to put at least three, three more gloves uh, of Casper doing real observations. <sighs> Thank you, that's it. Muchas gracias. Do we have time for one question? Yes. Really? You mentioned um, that you were synchronizing your input Yes. Uh, GPS. Yes. Um, are you just using the GPS or are you, do you have a, a reference signal as well, a clock? Mm, no. no. Oh, for that word only allows uh, PPS. I mean, you can use all the reference signal, the 10 megahertz, or the PPS. We're using the PPS because we need to synchronize the, all the boards to start the acquisition at exactly the same time, and we need to know that exactly time so we can do the pulsar timing. Luckily, those words, the clock that they have, are good enough to keep uh, their, their sample along at least four hours that we are observing the pulsar. So that was a concern. First, we start using the 10 megahertz signal because it seems the more logical thing to do, but we couldn't synchronize the words because they don't have time. So we moved to PPS, and luckily, it worked. You mentioned uh, converting to a laser as well. That's very expensive. You... No, I mean, no. The laser, the laser is already there. It's in other institute. Okay. And we have a fiber optic connected between us. And we have the signal through the fiber optics oh, okay. connected. Right. So we already have the signal. And the idea is to try to play with it and see if we can get even a better result on, on the timing. Of that. All right. Let's thank Guillermo one more time. Thank you.